Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner podcast, also known as the little podcast that could. I think I can. I think I can. Sometimes I don't think I can. Well, uh, folks, assuming I did not catch pneumonia from our latest ministry endeavor this morning, um, this might be, uh, depending on how the scheduling works, this might be the first thing you hear out of me in 2023, <clears throat> assuming the rapture don't happen and or whatever. Uh, I, presumably, if I post this and I just schedule it, and the rapture happens, it'll still it'll it'll still get posted. Um, got an email once from a dead guy. That was a little unsettling. Had a guy at work that died, and then uh, he had set his email uh, account up to uh, send out these periodic notifications of something. I got an email from him about two weeks after he passed. A little unsettling. But so let's, let's assume I didn't die. Let's assume I'm still, um, you know, here. And uh, you know, so we went out there and we did our thing this morning at a at a at a local parade. And uh, the Lord has never promised me in the Bible that the weather would be favorable, and it definitely was not favorable. So we, uh, I rode in the back of a pickup truck that we'd converted into a float, and um, holding up my banner and uh, probably twenty not twenty knot winds, uh, it, it, probably in the forties. And if you're listening to this and you're in Vermont or some. You know, some other godforsaken place like that. 40 degrees is, you know, shirt sleeve weather or whatever. Uh, but this is Georgia. We shut we shut the roads down at like, you know, 40 degrees. Uh, and, and, you know, we cut the grass at 110 and then we shut the roads down at 40 because that's just how we roll. But anyway, so out there and I got all wet, soaked to the bone and then, uh, you know, had to go uh, run various errands and finally got dried off. I think I escaped uh, the pneumonia. And so that's good. So this evening, uh, here in the shed, I just want, just want to talk to you about a, a passage of scripture, and then I'm going to give you the usual take on it. I'm going to give you why I think the usual take on it is the usual take, and I'm going to talk to you about how I got a sort of different take on it. And, uh, you know, so there you go. Ezra is where we're going to be at. Ezra, little bitty book in the middle of the back of your Old Testament. And we're going to be at Ezra, Ezra 3. I'm going to read a big chunk. And we're going to go from there. And when the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered them, themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and the, his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shilatel, and his brethren. And he built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings there and unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the feast of the tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to custom, as the duty of every day required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons, and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money of also to the masons and to the carpenters and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and them of Tyre to bring the cedar trees from Lebanon to the seed of Joppa, according to the grant they had of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now in the second year of their coming to the house of, of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shilatel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak. Jo Let me pause for a second. This is how you pronounce Bible names. You pronounce them quickly and with great confidence. You don't know how to say them, neither does anybody else. So just roll through them. The son of Josadak and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together, to set forward the workmen of the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundations of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks to the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chiefs of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of the joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. That is the entire chapter 
of Ezra 3. So the context of Ezra 3, because context is key, uh, is that these people had come back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> they had been carted off to Babylon. They'd spent 70 years in Babylon. And now they were back. Actually, they weren't back. Uh, for the most part, it was their kids that were back. And uh, God had kept his promise. He sent them down to ba uh, to Babylon to uh, to um, be off the land and give the land a rest. Uh, there's the whole backstory that goes into all that. They had not observed Sabbaths. They had not observed Passovers. They had just used the land and used the land. They had not observed the years of Jubilee. And the land was just slap wore out. And God was tired of them not doing what he said. So he had them carted off to Babylon. And they spent a year in Babylon for every year of Passover that they missed or every year of Sabbaths that they would missed. So all that's in the past. That's where Daniel's at. Uh, that's where uh, 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 Jeremiah's at. That's where uh, you know all that, a lot of that stuff happens. There happens in that captivity. Well, this is after that captivity. They come back, and, and one of the first things to go back to, and the, you read about it in the book of Nehemiah, is you re read about them rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, so that uh, while they're rebuilding everything else, um, the uh, the enemies of, of of their people can't uh, you know storm the place and take what's left. But here in Ezra three. They are beginning to rebuild the temple. And uh, so you get down there to verse, uh, looks like it's verse 12 or so. Let's look again. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this first house was, or the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. I have heard on more than one occasion a Baptist preacher sit standing in a Baptist pulpit in the American South, take Ezra 3, verse 12, and use it to teach that uh, the old ways are best, and that these old men that saw this foundation being laid were weeping uh, for the good old days. And that this young generation who was doing the manual labor and was doing the work and was setting everything up, that they just they just had no appreciation for the older ways and the older paths. Now, you are within reason. You're you're free to read yourself into the Bible story. I can't stop you. But I'll tell you why I think that that's. Uh, and I don't claim to be a mind reader or nothing. But I'll tell you why I think that the uh, on more than one occasion, a Baptist preacher standing in a Baptist pulpit in the American South has had exactly that take on that verse. I started noticing something a few years back. Uh, we 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 changed churches a couple of times, and um, there are all over the South, all over South Georgia, or specifically where I'm at. I can't speak for your neighborhood, but I can speak for mine. Uh, all over this area, there are uh, church buildings that were built in the 80s, 90s, 70s. And um, when you walk in there, you can tell that this was built, you know, back then, just whatever. Um, uh, they are, these buildings are built. These buildings are paid for. Um, these buildings were built to hold 150, 200, 300 people. You can look at the size of the building. A buddy of mine got, uh, he got asked to preach at a, uh, a church uh, over, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes from us. And he say, would you come down, you and your family just kind of sit in on the services so, you know, that we have a friendly face in the crowd. And so I went in there and, and we sat in this building and it was a nice building. I mean, I mean, everything was, everything worked and it was just a big place and it could have held probably 150, 200 people in a town of 2000 people probably could have held 10% of the town. That is. Yeah. 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 Two, two, yeah, okay, yeah. The math is right. Uh, and there was nine people there, not counting my family and his about, uh, I don't know, three miles from where I'm sitting is a very nice building full of very nice people. The building was obviously built in the mid eighties and it, in, in, in a town of once again, about 1500 people back then that, that church building will probably hold, I don't know, 200 people. And what's keeping the doors open is, uh, you know, eight or nine, 10, 12 people, let's say 15 on a good day. If all of granny's grandkids come to visit, you know, maybe 18, 20. And, um, we were part of a church up about an hour north of here where uh, the, the church had not had a visitor in nine years and the building had been built and paid for in 1963. It had been built, it had been paid for for some time and it was a nice building, but there was nobody going there. 
So then, I, so I noticed that. I started noticing that a lot. I started looking around at huge buildings or big buildings with very, 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 very small congregations. And then I started reading some of these books. You know, I talked briefly about the, the Tom Malone book that I read, and I've got a book uh, written by a uh, uh, written, I don't know, written by or written uh, written about uh, Ralph Sexton Sexton Senior, <laughs> and 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 I've I've, I've heard uh, you know enough old preachers say uh, there was something that happened in America spiritually uh, in the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties. I mean, there was about forty solid years where something happened in America, and and there was a big interest in the Bible, a big interest in Christianity, and a lot of souls were were uh, were built. Uh, you know, Tom Malone, we talked about over there at uh, uh, the the church in um, uh, what's it called, Emmanuel Baptist Temple or whatever it is in uh, in Pontiac, Michigan. How they they had to they had a building and they filled it up, and they had to build another building and they filled that up, and they had to build other campuses. Uh, you know, uh, uh, to hold people, and there's just people coming out their ears. Well, um, I dare say that's not the problem right now. Even in churches that are growing, you can look around the church. You know, the church, the church we're currently uh, attending, um, the building we sit in is is was built to accommodate the crowd when the building that is now the fellowship hall uh, was was the main building. So all over the place, you can see these huge buildings or big buildings designed to hold. 10% or 15% of the population of the town and there's 30 or 40 people keeping the doors open. It's an older crowd. Uh, not necessarily where we're at, but most church, most Baptist churches in the South, everybody's over 60 or most people are over 60. And most of the people who have been there have been there a hundred years. And it's just, it's just how it is. And so if I was an older preacher, see, I, I'm going somewhere with this. If I was an older preacher I could see how I could stand there in a Baptist pulpit in a Baptist church and look at a building that is holding a tenth of what it was designed to build to hold. And I could lament in my heart about the good old days when this building was full. I could see that. I, I mean, I, I if you look at the, 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 uh, the uh, what do you call it? The picture, the thumbnail uh, for my podcast. That's a picture taken back in the 30s up in Chicago. I saw the Pacific Garden Mission. And there's a guy out there preaching. I don't know if you got it up, you can see it. But there's a guy standing there preaching. <laughs> and uh, and there's a crowd there watching or listening to him. We don't uh, necessarily get that anymore. And so I have some sympathy towards people that will look at uh, the, the place they're called to labor. And for whatever reason, the interest uh, is not there that was there two generations ago. And the results aren't there that were there two two generations ago, and the laborers aren't there two generations ago. You know, we we worked this parade today, and I I I, I went around and shook every tree I could find, and we could not get anybody uh, except one of my kids uh, to walk along the parade route while we were preaching and pass out gospel tracts. Just nobody, just nobody wanted nothing to do with it. Now it turns out he didn't do it either because it was pouring down rain, and so that just left his his chucklehead dad in the back of the truck with a banner. But he was there. He was there. And, 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 you know, but we couldn't get the interest. So, so I could see myself. I could see if I was, uh, you know, in my sixties and I had been a young man, a younger man back at the tail end of whatever that was that was going on in America between 1940 something and 1980 something. And I had seen that. And then I'm looking at the situation now. I could see how I could, I would say, man. The good old days when people loved God. The good old days when the church house was full. The good old days when we had laborers that wanted to go out and labor. I could see that because I, I have great sympathy towards that. <clears throat> and so I could see how a man could look at Ezra 3 and look at these two classes of people. The old men that weep at the sight of this foundation being laid. And the young men that shout for joy. And I could see how, if I read myself into the story... I could say, well, that's those youngins just don't know any better. They don't know how good it was back in the day. I, I could see that. We made a trip out to San Diego one time. That's where I got saved at. I, I'm not. I'm not chasing too much of a rabbit. Um, made a trip out to San Diego. Uh, I don't. Uh, we made a couple trips. Uh, I want to say five years after I'd left, 
and uh, went back and hooked up with one of my buddies that we we cut our tre- our teeth together out there preaching on the streets and in, in the corner of uh, Fourth and Broadway in downtown San Diego Horton Plaza area and uh, which is not even there anymore. But uh, we uh, he introduced me because the, the street preaching had kind of died off a little bit, and I called him up and I said, "Man, listen, I, I was going through some stuff on this end out in Georgia." And I, I just needed to get back to basics. I needed to go back and get back to where the world made sense. And to me, the world made perfect sense on the corner of 4th and Broadway in San Diego. Preaching the gospel to lost people. That that made sense to me. And so I just I just I needed to go do that. If that makes any sense, it was you can say, oh, we went back to Bethel, whatever you want to call it. That's what I did. So my good friend Curtis Jones, a uh, remarkable man in many ways, he said, All right, we'll go. And so we went, and so, but but before he we went, there was a. I, was, I went up to the church house and everything, and and we're and he introduces me to a bunch of people uh, that were you know didn't know me because I've been gone five years, and that's how it works. They just you know you, you you stick your finger in the in the in the in the in the cup of water, and then you pull your finger out, and there's no hole there. It just fills up, and life goes on. Everybody forgets about you. That's okay because you're not that important. Um. So anyway, he introduced me to these fellas. This is Mike Alford. He is an old school street preacher. And I so you know, I said, how's it going? And afterwards, I'm like, dude, um, what makes us so old school? What makes me old school? He said, brother, the, uh, the man that trained us is dead. And out of all the men that he trained, I think we're the only, there's only three or four of us that are still doing this. He says, we're old school. We are his legacy. So I, so I, I get the, 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 the tendency to to romanticize the past and the tendency to read yourself into this text and the tendency to say, well, that's the those youngsters, they didn't know how good it was, and so they didn't know no better, so they shouted for joy. But we saw the other temple, and so we're gonna weep because it's just not as good. I get the tendency to do that, but I think I think that's the wrong take on that. I think it's wrong to say that what's in front of them is never gonna be as good as what was behind them. I think that's wrong. I'll tell you why. You need to think about this for a minute. They had been in Babylon. These old men, it says they're ancient, doesn't say how old they are, I don't know. I guess I could run all the verses and figure out what the biblical definition of ancient is, but I'm not going to right now. These ancient men, the Bible calls them, they had been in Babylon for 70 years. So let's say they're 90. Let's say the oldest one there is 90. Let's say he's 100. That means that he had left for Babylon. The oldest guy there had left for Babylon when he was 30. Uh, There's possible there are some ancient men there. Um, So they remembered the first temple. So let's say, how old are you when you start remembering things? I mean, my life's a blur, but I've I've taken a lot of blows to the head. Um, but let's say let's say you start really remembering things, you know, things like uh, church services or whatever. Let's say you start remembering them in, at five or six years old. Let's say five for easy math. So then you spend 70 years in Babylon. Now you're 75 and you're back in Jerusalem where you were born and where you grew up until you got carted off to Babylon. And you're looking at this temple being laid and you're remembering the former temple. Okay. Well... It's fair to ask the question. You just came back from Babylon. It's fair to ask the question, what was it like when you left Jerusalem? What were the conditions like when you and your people got loaded up onto, however they loaded them up, and got carried off to Babylon? What was it like? Was it the good old days? Well, I mean, we can take a quick look here. Second Chronicles 33 it talks about a king named Manasseh, and he reigned for 55 years. He was kind of a, a meathead. Uh, Second Chronicles 33, uh, a little bit further down, you get uh, Ammon. He was only king for two years. You get Josiah, and Josiah would be the exception. Josiah reigned for 31 years, and just there was some there was some revival that happened during Josiah's uh, 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 reign in Second Chronicles 34. In Second Chronicles 36, you've got a Je- Jehoah, who was a political appointee. And so if you take all these men's reigns and you add them up, what you have is you have uh, almost a, a hundred years of, of defilement and paganism. 
They had brought in elements of the, of the cultures around them into God's temple. And then when they didn't do that, they just ignored it. I mean, when Josiah, when they, or when they bring Josiah that, the, the book of the law, they're shocked by what's written in the book of the law. They're get, they, they, they set about cleaned up the temple and, 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 you know, they find the book and they bring the book in, they read it out loud. And oh my goodness, we got to, God's going to knock us in the head if we don't get this thing straightened out. What's amazing is that they didn't know. The guy who's the priest working in the temple didn't know. So you're talking 100 years, you're talking three or four generations of apostasy leading up to Nebuchadnezzar's army shows up outside the gates of Jerusalem to throw everybody in, a, in, in the station wagon and carry them off to Babylon. We're going to look here at Second Chronicles uh, 36, I think it is. It's just, it, you know, you got to think about things. You can't just read yourself into the story because then all of a sudden everything becomes about you and, and, and you know, and it's easy to do and it's fun to do, but it's not right to do. Second Chronicles 36 over here or somewhere in here. It's 23. You keep going. That's too far. I know. I should have this tab. I should have this all figured out. But if you want to listen to a good podcast you'd listen to something else second chronicles 36 uh looks like at verse 20 it says uh and to them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdoms of persia so that gives you some reference for how long they were there to fulfill the word of the lord by the mouth of jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate she kept sabbath to fulfill Three score and ten years. So you're talking um, seventy years of no Sabbath ob- observances. E- even I don't, you know, you have a little bit during Josiah's reign, but maybe it wasn't uh, official. Maybe it wasn't widespread. Maybe it was just I, I don't know. You've got thirty something years of no Passovers. You know, as Doug Fisher told me once, just because it's ancient doesn't mean it's right. And honestly, if these men were sitting around lamenting about the good old days and, and how great things were back in the day, back when you know we had the other temple, the real temple, the old temple, the temple we knew as we were kids, the good old days which you got got you carted off to Babylon. The 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 neglect that your parents and your grandparents, and maybe even if you, if you were one of the older crowd uh that came back, the, the, the neglect with which you treated the things of God, that's what got you bowing down to images in, in, in Babylon. The temple had been in decline for years before Nebuchadnezzar even his, 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 his army even shows up. So you can, so this so if if you if you're a Baptist preacher standing in a Baptist pulpit and and lamenting the good old days, I mean I, I won't say I'm not sympathetic toward it. I won't say that sometimes I do the same thing. But this is not the passage you want to run to. To uh to uh point towards a a unnecessary romanticization of the good old days. Because frankly, the good old days they, they had their they had their high spots, but uh, there was also some shady stuff that went on because there were still people there. But back to Ezra three. Uh, so so here they are. This this generation comes back. God had kept His promise. He brought them back, and they're being allowed to build the walls in Nehemiah. They're being allowed to rebuild the temple in Ezra. They can finally start serving God the way God told them to. Uh, God is done chastening them. And so the Bible says over to Ezra 3, verse 2, Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shitalel, and his brethren. They built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. I'll tell you why this situation, that what these young men are doing, is better than the situation that was present uh, when they all got carted off to Babylon. You see, right there from the beginning, their adherence to what God actually said. They didn't build the, uh, they didn't lay the foundation and, and and lay the altar and everything in accordance with what they thought or what they'd drawn up on the back of a cocktail napkin while they're in Babylon. They did it in accordance to how the Bible said do it, and that's a reason to celebrate. In verse four, the same chapter, it says they kept also the feast of tabernacles as, as it is written. And offer the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. So they kept the Feast of Tabernacles the way the Feast of Tabernacles had been written down in their scriptures. 
Uh, you see it again in verse 10. And then when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel. Where do you find out about their apparel? You didn't learn about that in Babylon. You learned that by opening up a Bible. Set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. You say, well, that's not Bible. Well, here's the deal. Uh, and you could say wh where that's binding or where that's canon or whatever. But uh, David was the one that set up the 24 courses of Levites. He split the body of Levite uh, priests into 24 groups that rotated through their temple service. And so according to this, they, they, they set that all back up. They took the Levites that were there. They split them up into 24 courses, set up a schedule, and got this thing rolling again. And over and over and over again, there's two generations here. There's a bunch of old men who had been born. They'd been born free. And because of the sin and wickedness of their, of their nation, and maybe of themselves, they had become slaves. That's one generation. And then there's a, bunch, there's a second generation that had been born slaves, and God had set them free. And so that young generation, the guys that were doing the labor, the guys that were setting everything up in order, they looked at that deal and they said, "Okay, we can do this the way the old the, we can do this the way the old timers did it, but the way the old timers did it wasn't so hot, or else we wouldn't have grown up in Babylon." I mean, you're talking about people that had never been to Jerusalem; they had been born in Babylon and had grown up in Babylon, and that's all they'd ever known was Babylon. And here they are; they're in Jerusalem, and they are in charge of the services. And they can go with what worked in the past or what they were told about the old, good old days, or they can go to what the Bible says. I'm not trying to imply that in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, up to the 80s, that those men were not doing their best to apply themselves to the Bible. I've been accused of saying that, and that's not what I'm going with. I think everybody, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt until I feel like they no longer deserve the benefit of the doubt. And I've, I, you know, one of, one of my dearest uh, heroes, old man, used to live in Pensacola, um, used to have a Bible institute there until he passed away. I think that guy was doing the best he could to stick to the scriptures. And I believe every once in a while that man was a, so far off. I don't know how he found his way back. I think sometimes he, he's just a person like everybody else. And he read his own situation or his own prejudices or his own worldview into the scriptures that when it wasn't there. And I may do I may do a, 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 a podcast just about that old man and how much I love him and how much of a tangled mess he is sometimes. But these this young crowd that came in, that came out of captivity, that God had set them free, they were living proof of God's promises, and they said, "Let's do this the Bible way." And so, it, it, let, let's say let's say I live to be the old man of God, and I don't know what. What point you join that you join that club? I climbed out of the back of that truck this today, and I felt like I was over seventy. Uh, but let's say I live long enough to be the old man of God. Whatever, and there's two or three generations of young, eager street preachers underneath me. Man, do you realize how much stuff would have to change for that to happen? <laughs> anyway. Uh, and these men say, Brother Mike, we love you, and, and we appreciate all you did back in the good old days of the 2020s, from the late 90s into the 2020s. But we're going we're gonna to take this thing back to basics a notch, and we're going to do our best to get into scriptures ourselves and not just emulate what you did, but try to figure out what God wants us to do according to the Bible. Well, you know, that would be such an honor. I mean, that would be part, you know, that, that, that would be like, well, I taught these boys, uh, and, and, and the proof that I taught them right is the fact that they're willing to go against what I say if the Bible says something different. See, we don't need you to look at it that way. I, I don't, uh, here's what's happening in Ezra 3. It's not a bunch of old men looking back at the good old days and weeping because these youngsters just don't get it. I really don't believe that's what's happening. I believe these men understood when this thing started to come together and they've got the scriptures right there to back them up 
and the scriptures that they can look at just as these young guys can have. And they looked at their 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 generation, and they understood that their generation had dropped the ball. And it was too late to fix it. You can't go back and change the past. And your only hope is that this next generation fixes it. And to fix it, they're going to have to not do some of the things you did. How about that? (laughs) Oh, my, my, my. So God had raised up a new generation out of the ashes of their failure. Out of the old man's failure. He God had raised up a new generation out of those ashes to serve him. Because at the end of the day, serving him is more important than your good old days. That's what I think is going on in Ezra 3. I think those men are weeping because they see their own failure. I don't think they're all weeping out of sorrow. I think some of them are weeping out of joy. That this thing is not over. God's still on his throne. The work still goes on. And I lament the state of the American church as much as anybody else does. Maybe more so. Because I'm not a person who is content to sit back and attend church three times a week. And listen to a guy that I mostly agree with 45 minutes or so three times a week. And call that serving God. I just don't think that's sufficient. I think the need is too urgent. I think salvation is too urgent. I think uh, the field really is white under harvest. I think all those things. So I, so I'm always looking for new ways to get the gospel out. I'm always looking for new ways to serve God, and I'm always trying to look at my own life and find uh, character flaws and sin and root it out and hunt it down, so that I can have the best, so I can give Jesus Christ the best possible service, the sort of service that He deserves. And sometimes in doing that, you feel very alone, even though you're not. And you feel like nobody else understands, even though sometimes they do. You get that whole Elijah thing going on. That's a rough gig. So I lament the the state of the American church in the Bible Belt. And I'm not going to run to Second Chronicles 7.14 to say that enough of us pray God's going to do this miraculous thing. Because honestly... I mean, let's be real. People have been praying for revival in the American South my entire life. And I'm an old guy. People have been holding revival meetings and begging God to show up the way he did in the old days, quote unquote, which they mean 40s to 80s. They've been doing that since the 80s. And for whatever reason, we haven't seen the results or the growth or the enthusiasm that we've asked for. And if you want to ask me why I think that is, I man, I truth is, I don't know. I really don't know. It is something I think about a lot, but it's something I don't know. Having said all that, uh, I do I do long for the old days. I wish I wish we had 25, 30 people going out street preaching with us. I wish lots of things. But God is true and God is right. And this is God's church and this is God's business. And maybe my vision just isn't long enough. Maybe just... I don't know. I keep looking at this little waveform on this recording thing, looking at these big long pauses I'm taking. I'm like, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. I really, this is this is the sort of thing I think about. So as inclined as I am, as concerned as I am about the American church in the South, particularly, um, there's there's a much bigger thing going on. God is the God of new things. God is the God of better covenants. And God is still doing something. He may not be doing it here to the degree that I would like him to. But it is God's business what God does and where God does it. And we in the American church have to stop looking at ourselves as the church and every place else as the mission field. 
There's some amazing things going on in, 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 the, in the Muslim world. There's some amazing things going on in Africa. There's some amazing reports coming out of China. God's still doing things. So rather than sit around and lament about the old days and tell hero tales about how God used to be towards us, maybe we ought to commit ourselves to serving Him under, under very sparse conditions. It's not like that's a unique situation. You know, Jeremiah preached for every day the same message, it looks like, for 26 years. And he never saw any fruit out of his ministry. Long after he's dead, Daniel's sitting there in Babylon reading Jeremiah. And Daniel realizes God's fixing to get us out of here. I, I know this has been 35 minutes of rambling and, 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 and I got to find a landing spot somewhere. Don't romanticize the old days to the point in which you you don't enjoy the here and now. Today I sat in the back of a pickup truck in the pouring rain, preaching through a bullhorn that kept malfunctioning because it had been, it had been rained on for an hour. And we had a Publix a grocery bag wrapped around the thing to try to keep the water out of the circuit trade. It was still cutting in and cutting out. And I handed them, I reached down through the through the side uh, window of this truck and I handed the microphone to, to a man who was probably my best friend in the world. Darnell G. Robinson, the legendary Darnell G. Robinson. And he sat in there and and and, and he, he preached in the rain with the with the same microphone that was still cutting in and out. And I kept having to plug it and unplug it and turn it on and off and shake it and everything to keep it going to get to the end of the parade route. And I sat there with my daughter driving and my son sitting next to me. And it was a glorious, glorious well, he wouldn't sit next to me. He was he was everybody was inside the warm, dry truck except me. Um it was glorious. And I could say, man, I wish we had 25 people going with us. I wish we had 30 people going with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish every time we got up and preached, people would come to Christ. Yeah, I want that too. In the meantime, man, don't don't miss all, don't miss what's going on now for something that went on 30 years ago. You can't live there. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And that is way off from where I started here. The good old days. Billy Joel, not that I, I okay, I'm, I'm going to go, ahead and, since I said the man's name, I'm going to go ahead and quote him. He did a stupid song back in the 90s, 80s probably. The good old days weren't always that good, and tomorrow is not as bad as it seems. Oh, the worldly wisdom of Billy Joel. What a beacon of light in a time of trouble and murkiness and despair. Ah. <sighs> I guess you gotta find your you gotta find your help where you, where you can. All right, I'm gonna stop this. I will not assault your uh, your ears anymore with my ramblings for a little while. Uh, this is probably the first one you hear of the new year. So happy new year! Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time, and I'll see you on the other side. <laughs>